and vote after vote at the United Nations, we have seen a state rallying behind a call for a just peace, not just for peace, for a just peace, and for Russia to withdraw from Ukraine and respect its territorial integrity and sovereignty. Our collective support to Ukraine has been impressive and must continue so that Ukraine and the international law prevail. But the core rationale for why we need partners goes beyond Ukraine. Yesterday, some of our ministers told us you make a lot of phone calls about Ukraine. Yes, but not only about Ukraine. When matters, what worries us, goes much further than Ukraine. And we know that not, no one, no country, acting alone can address challenges as the weakening of multilateralism, the return of power politics across the world, the renewed assertiveness of authoritarian regimes, and the mix of conventional and hybrid threats that we are facing. The consequences of climate change and the increased competition over natural resources that will go and go from the Arctic to the Sahel region. On all that front, we need partners. And to partner is deeply rooted on the DNA of the European Union because we, ourselves, the European Union is based on cooperation among partners. And every European Union policy, including defense, is the result of cooperation. We change the logic of confrontation by the logic of cooperation. So it's logical that we see partnership as an essential part of our security and defense agenda. Just a few weeks, even days, after the start of Russia's aggression against Ukraine, the European leaders adopted what we call the Strategic Compass, which is an ambitious plan to strengthen our security and defense policy on the horizon of the next five to ten years. And the fact that this compass includes a full chapter devoted to partnership is a clear message. We regard our security and defense agenda on the one hand and our cooperation with partners on the other hand as mutually reinforcing. So to answer the first question was quite easy because it's quite evident. The second question is a little bit more difficult. How do we translate this principle into practice? How can the European Union offer? What and how? Well, let me, let me remind, let me think about the past. Not many people know the story of the European Union security years ago. It's not something that uh, we invented after the war in Ukraine started. 20 years ago, we deployed our first military operation in the Western Balkans, and then in Africa. And after, it has followed two decades of engagement, deploying over 40 missions across all continents, up to the most recent missions for Ukraine, certainly, but also for Armenia, and easier. But it's fair to say that our response to the war in Ukraine in particular has changed the way we in Europe, we regard our security and defense agenda. At the same time, it has changed the way you, our partners, regard our agenda and the opportunities that uh, it may offer. I can say that our 
resolve and our action has surprised many. We did not let Russia divide us. On the contrary, we have been and we continue being united, more united than ever. We have adopted 10 sanctions package to exert a maximum collective pressure on Russia. We have cut our dependency on Russian oil and gas in a matter of months. Uh, frankly, no one could imagine that we were to be able to do it, but we did it. We have mobilized 3.6 billion so far under the European peace facilities to support Ukraine with military equipment. And we have break a taboo by financing the supply of weapons to a country at war using not the resources of the European Union budget, but our community resources. And we have deployed a training mission to train up 30,000 soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers, before the end of 2023. And now we are working together to jointly procure equipment and artillery and munition to replenish our stocks and to deliver more support to Ukraine to defend itself and ramping the capacities of our defense industry, which is key. I think that putting all these things together represents an unprecedented effort for the European Union that was not foreseen. And I know from my visits around the world, um, with my discussions among or with many of you, that this new European Union security and defense agenda has raised interest and opened venues for new forms of cooperation. And many partners from Africa to the Middle East and our Eastern neighborhood are increasingly asking for support in areas such as geospatial intelligence through our satellite center, cyber resilience, strategic communication, but also, also lethal equipment. Navies in the Americas, in the Middle East and Asia, are increasingly interested to conduct joint activities with our naval operations. Let me mention Operation Atalanta, that has a very good track on this, with naval exercises conducted with Japan, with India, and Oman, to name a few. So this brings me to the third question, the really important question towards the future. What can we do together? What can we do together? That's where we are here. Decades of security and defense partnership has, uh, has shown us that we have to be humble, humble, flexible, and pragmatic. That we need to listen to each other and to do lessons learned. Yesterday, one minister was saying to us, it's not a matter of not sharing the same values. Yes, we share the same values, but maybe we don't share the same priorities, and you don't take our priorities enough into your attention. Well, maybe. So let's be humble, flexible, and pragmatic, and take into consideration the priorities of all of our partners. And looking and going for tailored approaches that reflects the realities of the country or the region where we are dealing with. Last year, we adopted the strategic compass, I said. There, there are a concrete number of new objectives. Allow me to mention some of them on which I would like to hear your views today. The first one, we have to enhance the effectiveness of our civilian and military missions and operations in supporting our partners. 
we have to increase the effectiveness of what we do. We have drawn lessons from the challenges we face in the Central African Republic and in Mali. In both countries, our missions were not sufficiently backed by an effort to equip our partners. And the Bangor Group, which is a ruthless proxy of the Russian regime, has used it to its advantage with the devastating results that we know for the local people and their security. So we need to adjust our way of working. And the strategic compass foresees the adaptation of our model of military missions. It should allow us to meet our partner expectations with more targeted training and equipment. More targeted and more partners. For example, the new training mission in Niger is going to be a new military partnership mission. It was launched last month with focus on maintenance and logistics with a light but a scalable footprint. We want also to apply more systematically the train and equip, not only train, train and equip model to our civilian missions. And this approach has already been providing good results in Niger and Somalia. We are now preparing a new mission in the Republic of Moldova to strengthen its capacity to counter hybrid threats. Second, we use a broad understanding of security and want to put more emphasis on prevention. Let me cite the case of the Gulf of Guinea. We don't have to run behind the crisis, but to prevent the crisis from happening. And the Gulf of Guinea is a case in point. They need an urgent support to tackle the spillover of the terrorist threat from the Sahel region. And instead of large military training missions, we need a small, agile teams of experts and trainees from the military, but also from the police that could be deployed quickly to address a specific request for targeted trainings, advice, intelligence, or equipment. And our planners are currently visiting the countries in the region to put this new approach in motion. Prevention is also increasingly guiding our civilian missions. Early this year, we established a civilian monitoring mission in Armenia in the areas of the border with uh, Azerbaijan. The aim is to contribute to build confidence between the two parties through a permanent and visible European Union presence on the ground. Third, we want to maximize the potential of the European peace facility. Nobody was expecting that, but uh, the history has made the European Peace Facility a real game changer for our missions and operations and our relations with our partners. We use the European Peace Facility so much during this first year of existence, over the 4.5 billion allocated, that the Council had to replenish it last December and I'm sure they will have to do it again. And without a doubt, it has been a crucial instrument to respond to Russia's war in Ukraine. But once again, it's not just about Ukraine. The EPF is a global instrument. It has enabled us to support African peace operations from Somalia to Mozambique, from the Lake Chad to the Sahel region, as well as our individual partners from Georgia and Moldova, to Tunisia, from Bosnia-Herzegovina to Lebanon and Jordan. And we will continue doing that. We know that our partners are increasingly interested, interested, interested sorry, in lethal support. Yes, 
what we have done for Ukraine can and will be done for others. And the first assistance measure to provide lethal equipment for African partners, Niger and Somalia, will be adopted soon. With that, the European Peace Facility can act as a structured and transparent trust fund for the international support for Ukraine, for example. And this is how a partner like Norway understands it. And thank you to Norway for channeling your support through the European Peace Facility and for contributing with personnel to the European Union training mission for Ukraine. That, as I said, will train 30,000 soldiers by the end of the year. Fourth, we have to strengthen our own resilience and we are ready to help our partners to build their own. We underline that cyber, hybrid warfare, foreign interference and manipulation, manipulation of information are critical dimensions for our partnership. We need and we want to strengthen our cyber dialogues with key partners, such as the United States first, but also with Japan and South Korea, to compare intelligence and coordinated sanctions against the perpetrators of cyber attacks. This will be more and more necessary because these cyber attacks will happen more and more often. For example, the Russia cyber attack on the satellite communication provider Viasat just before the start of the invasion of Ukraine had far-reaching consequences and we were quick to coordinate our response with the U.S. and other key partners within the G7. Soon, we will also be able to dispatch hybrid rapid response teams to address requests from our partners to identify vulnerabilities, investigate and provide concrete support. Fifth, and I am finishing, we want to train and exercises with our partners starting this year with the maritime domain. And we have the right tools to do so. Operation Atalanta has already developed from anti-piracy of the coast of Somalia into a broader maritime security operation covering a large spectrum of tasks in a much larger theater. First, it was against piracy in the coast of Somalia. Now it's a full security provider for the maritime roads along the coast of Africa. The last few months, Atalanta seized large volumes of drug, depriving al Shaba from major revenue. We are developing a second coordinated maritime presence in the northwestern Indian Ocean, building on the first experience in the Gulf of Guinea, and we hope that this will enable cooperation through ports, calls, and common exercises with countries in both regions. We organized live maritime exercises with partners. At the end of March, two Atalanta frigates will undertake exercises with a U destroyer. We want to do the same with Japan and Canada. We also remain active in the Indo-Pacific on maritime and other security issues with ASEAN. We have set up a concrete project on enhancing security cooperation in and with Asia. Six, we want to see our defense initiative paving the way for enhanced cooperation with partners. We have opened PESCO, our PESCO projects on military mobility to Canada, to Norway, to the United States, and more recently, to the United Kingdom. If you look at the European Defence Fund, a number of participants in our industrial programmes are controlled by non-European Union entities. As long as they fulfil our criteria, our partners are invited to join our defence initiative. And this is the perfect illustration 
of our commitment to work with NATO allies in the spirit of our joint European Union-NATO declarations. But it's not just NATO. A new number of partners from Norway to Ukraine, Serbia, can enjoy cooperation with our European Defence Agency. As you can see from all these examples, we are committed to shaping mutually beneficial partnerships at the bilateral and regional level. Yes, the war in Ukraine has tested the solidity of the relationship between the European Union and NATO. And the result is clear. Our cooperation is stronger than ever. Our political unity is rock solid. Our efforts at all levels are closely coordinated and mutually reinforcing. And in the field, from Bosnia and Herzegovina to Kosovo and Iraq, we are working hand in hand. This cooperation is equally valued with the United Nations. In all theaters where our missions are deployed, especially in Africa, the United Nations can count on us on our continued support from political and operational coordination to information sharing, satellite imaginary, all kind of coordination is open to the United Nations. And we want to do that also with the OCE, the African Union, and the ASEAN. Dear colleagues, there has been a broad travel through what we want to do with European defense projects. Our security and defense agency agenda is broad and we are developing our capacities fast. Because the world's needs and the security challenges we are facing are also growing. They are enormous. So we need to work more together. Be smart and creative. Together, we are stronger. And this all begins by thinking clearly and listening to each other carefully. This is our purpose. That's what I invite you to do just today, in stating your views, your needs, your expectations, your concerns. This is the purpose of this Schumann Forum. And I want to thank you again for being here. And let me also again to thank the European Parliament. Once upon the time I was president of this House, and I could never imagine that one day I was going to be here pushing for something such important as the European defense capabilities in a challenging world. So thank you for providing us with a great venue for our debates. Thank you to all of you for being here. I'm sure there is a lot of things that we can do together. Thank you. Thank you, High Representative, dear Ministers, Members of Parliament, Your Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. Welcome. Welcome to all of you here in the European Parliament for this first edition of the Schumann Security and Defence Forum. On behalf of my colleagues, let me say we are delighted to host you in our premises. This event is taking place at a crucial time. As rightly mentioned by the High Representative, the world is facing enormous geopolitical challenges. This forum is gathering, and it's an impressive view from up here, hundreds of high-level participants to precisely debate about how we will manage these common challenges just described by the High Representatives together. I am glad to see that the programme of today's Schumann Forum focuses on how to leverage our partnerships in building security and defence together, how to reinforce our collective resilience, 
how to respond jointly to crisis, securing our seas and maritime space, and most of all, how to uphold multilateralism and a rules-based international order. We are at the most significant turning point in our foreign and security policy since the end of the Cold War. The rules-based international order, founded on international law and the institutions of multilateralism, is under ever-increasing risk. Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine is an attack on the foundations of exactly this multilateral rules-based global order. And China's growing assertiveness and policies present challenges that need to be addressed. It is important to reiterate the key role of the United Nations in promoting effective multilateralism and protecting universal rules and values. The European Parliament, as you may know, is a staunch supporter of multilateralism and pushing for a stronger partnership between the European Union and the United Nations on common priorities. As regards external policies, the European Union is quickly adapting to these realities by making sure that our means are consistent with our objectives. The EU responded to the Russian war of aggression with a coherence and determination rarely seen before. Together with our international partners, we launched a series of sanctions that are having a severe impact on the Russian economy. We mobilized enormous additional funding for Ukraine and, as pointed out by the High Representative, for the first time delivered weapons to a country under attack. The Schuman Forum is a key deliverable of the fourth pillar of the EU strategic compass, the so-called partner pillar. In a recent resolution, the European Parliament considered the strategic compass adopted in March 2022, exactly one year ago, as an important step towards a genuine European Defence Union and must form the foundation of developing a common strategic culture at the level of both the European Union and our 27 member states. The strategic compass coordinates the multitude of initiatives that have been launched in recent years. In doing so, the strategic compass contributes to a genuine European Defence Union interoperable and complementary to our successful NATO alliance. The implementation now is crucial. As underlined both by the EU strategic compass and this NATO strategic concept, we are at a key juncture for Euro-Atlantic security and stability, more than ever demonstrating the importance of the transatlantic bond, calling for closer EU-NATO cooperation as NATO remains the foundation of collective defence for its allies and is so essential for our Euro-Atlantic security. To conclude, a more effective foreign policy must not align with a stronger security policy, but also requires us to all intensify partnerships. This is exactly why it is so important that the European Union and our member states are strengthening their relations with international organizations and partners you all represent. To complement these actions, the European Parliament's Committee on Foreign Affairs is putting a strong emphasis in developing our partnerships around the world with recent visits to the African Union, the Gulf Cooperation Council and ASEAN. The European Parliament engages with counterparts all across the world and especially with national parliaments as we want to signal that the foreign and security policies should be enshrined in strong democratic institutions and are the subject of democratic debates also with our citizens. From the perspective of the European Parliament, the only institution at EU level directly elected by the citizens all these actions need to be properly understood and well accepted by our citizens, especially at a time when authoritarian actors challenge our interests, values and democratic principles using multiple means, political, economic, technological and military on our continent. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a fruitful debate and exchanges. Thank you.
dit sur quoi Ça s'appelle, c'est sur l'Europe, ça s'appelle changer ou périr. Changer ou périr. Alors, vous dites ça Oui. Ça ne peut pas rester comme cela Non. Mesdames et messieurs, messieurs les ministres, chers amis, C'est un très grand plaisir et un honneur pour moi, comme vice-présidente de l'Institut Jacques Delors à Paris, de modérer cette première session euh, du premier Schumann Forum. Joseph Borrell, notre haut représentant, vient de donner les trois questions essentielles. Pourquoi avons-nous besoin de partenariats Qu'est-ce que l'Union peut offrir Et qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire ensemble Permettez-moi d'ajouter un mot comme « think tanker » autrement dit comme irresponsable politique. Nous vivons des temps difficiles. Nous vivons des temps dangereux. L'Europe, face à l'agression la, russe contre l'Ukraine, est en train de vivre une révolution géopolitique. Partout dans le monde, les conditions de la sécurité changent à une vitesse vertigineuse. Et devant la complexité de ces crises, devant leur interconnexion de ces crises, nous avons plus que jamais besoin de réflexion, d'humilité, de, comme disait Joseph Borrell, d'intelligence et d'innovation. Je crois personnellement que les vieilles recettes de sécurité du passé ne sont pas les bonnes recettes pour la sécurité du futur. Mais il y a une chose certaine parmi nos incertitudes, c'est que nous avons besoin de coopérer les uns les autres. Pour l'Union européenne, le partenariat et la coopération est une évidence stratégique et votre présence ici prouve que c'est aussi une évidence pour vos pays. Donc, soyez-en vraiment remerciés. I'm going now to turn to my distinguished panelists and I share with them The most important challenge that we have to face today is the timing. You are six very important persons coming from six very important countries or institutions. You have many things to say, very important maybe proposal to make. But I'm afraid, and I'm sure, we have to finish at 10.30. I mean, we cannot go more than that. So we don't have even the one hour I was promised to have. So please forgive me in advance. I will have to be very tough. You will have no more than three minutes, maximum four for your preliminary, preliminary intervention. And I will begin as we say in français à tout seigneur, tout honneur with the presidency of the EU Minister uh, Paul Johnson and you know that you will have one minute more than the other because you are the presidency of the EU. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Nicole. And in the spirit of partnership with my fellow colleagues here, I will try also to be stick to four minutes so, a, so we can share the time together. I also like to thank Joseph also and the EIS for arranging today's seminar on First Schumann's Forum on Partnership. I um, think it's very important. As you might know, the Swedish EU presence is two top priorities are supporting Ukraine and building partnerships. And we think this goes hand in hand, of course, as Ukraine is a candidate country and a future member of the EU and NATO. Now, of course, we support Ukraine in many different ways. In Sweden, of course, we support it on a bilateral basis. And I'm proud that Sweden is sending tanks, we're sending infantry, infantry fighting vehicles, and we're sending hovisers. So our bilateral support for Ukraine so far has been uh, the net value of about 1.5 billion euros in one year. But I think it's even more important what we do on an international level. Of course, we have the U.S leadership under the Rammstein format, which has been very helpful, but I think I'm also glad that the EU is very committed to supporting Ukraine, just as uh, Joseph said, uh, EU man Ukraine, I think is a very important milestone for us, being able to train 30,000 Ukrainian soldiers in one year. Yesterday's announcement was also a very important uh, milestone in the EU being able, have, having the ability to provide the Ukrainians with artillery ammunition, uh, one million shots 
Seychelles in one year. I think that's a very important milestone as well for, for the EU as a security provider and supporting Ukraine. I always say that supporting Ukraine, Ukraine is the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. And it's also about investing into our own security. And we will be with Ukraine as long as it takes in order for them to regain their freedom and territorial integrity. At the same time, we cannot take a strategic timeout from other challenges that, are, that the EU is exposed to. I'm thinking about increased global uh, competition. I'm thinking about an increasingly assertive China on the international stage. I'm also thinking in terms of the Wagner Group's expansion in sub saharan Africa. We need a common strategy on combating the Wagner Group's expansion in Africa. I want to be clear there. Uh, Sweden has also proposed that we should have a Stratcom initiative to deal debunk uh, Russian uh, misinformation and disinformation directed against Africa. I think that's also very, very important. Now, also on, on partnership, let me also say how much we value also an increasing partnership between the EU and NATO. EU and NATO has never worked as closely together as they have up until the run-up and during the war in Ukraine, and that's very good. Now, of course, we can also build on the new EU-NATO joint partnership declaration that was launched in January. I think it includes very interesting aspects for new dimensions of cooperation, such as climate change, such as uh, space, and such as emerging and disruptive technologies. And uh, PESCO, as, just, uh, as Joseph said, I think that's a very good case in point where EU and NATO can really make a difference in cooperation. I think there's another reason also for deepening EU-NATO cooperation, and that is, of course, increasing overlapping membership. Sweden and Finland hopefully being on our way into NATO and Denmark being fully engaged into the European security and defence policy. So overlapping membership with respect to the difference division of labour where the EU as a security provider is best added value is in the nexus between internal and external security. That's what we can very well deliver. And then of course when it comes to Article 5 and common defence that's something, that's a job for NATO. That's the national division of labour that we see. Uh, secondly, on EU's partnership as well, I think we're very encouraged also with, the, as the High Representative said, having individually tailored partnership here. I think the EU and the United States can do many good things together, and I'm very glad that we're well on our way to closing an uh, association uh, administrative agreement between the EDA and the United States. That's good progress. We want to work with Canada, Norway, United Kingdom, and also with uh, Turkey. I think that's very important, and Iceland on this kind of individual partnerships. So that uh, indeed is very, very helpful for us uh, on that dimension. Just finally, some, some uh, thinking on how we do this well and effectively. And just as the high, high representative said, I think it's very important we have this individually tailored partnership. We make sure that this kind of meeting just don't generate more meetings, but they actually accomplish operational effect. I think that's really a key for us to, to uh, when we work on the partnership dimension. The other thing, as I think for us in the EU, when we launch new initiatives, being uh, the hybrid toolbox, being this uh, new space strategy for secure and def security and defense, being the, the updated maritime strategy that we're doing, uh, or the hybrid toolbox, I think what we need to think of is, is partnership st from the start uh, because there's very few things unfortunately that the EU can accomplish if we don't have these strong partnerships with key countries. Last point I want to end up on Monday. I always say that history is changed by good decisions that are implemented. EU building partnership is such a good decision. So what we need to focus is, is on implementation, implementation and implementation also on partnership. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank you very much, and I, I, I congratulations for having respected so much uh, the, 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 the timing of this uh, first intervention. I have some questions, but I think I will have all the panelists together, and then I will maybe uh, begin with the first question, question uh, hoping that we will have time also for debate with the room. The second speaker on my list is uh, Defence Minister from Niger, uh, Monsieur Akassoum Indatou. Bonjour, bienvenue. You have the floor. 
Bonjour et merci de nous donner cette occasion de participer donc à ce premier forum, ce qui est une chose particulièrement importante pour un pays comme le Niger. Le Niger, vous savez, c'est un pays qui a été confronté par le, euh, au terrorisme dès le début, juste après la crise libyenne. Malheureusement, au Niger, qu'est-ce qui s'est passé C'est que nous n'avons pas une armée suffisamment préparé pour faire face à une telle situation, comme beaucoup de pays africains à l'époque, c'est le cas du Mali, c'est le cas du Burkina Faso et d'autres pays. Merci, nous avons pu bénéficier très tôt du soutien, du partenariat avec un certain nombre de pays, notamment des pays européens, qui nous ont aidés à mettre en place une armée, à former cette armée, à l'équiper et à lui donner les infrastructures pour lui permettre de faire face à la situation devant laquelle elle s'est trouvée. Elle a pu faire ce qu'il fallait faire. Elle a pu défendre l'intégrité de notre territoire. Elle a pu défendre à ce que la population du Niger puisse arriver à aller régulièrement, quotidiennement, à ses préoccupations sans aucun problème. Ce qui se passe, le partenariat auquel nous avons eu affaire, c'était un partenariat d'abord bilatéral. Il y a beaucoup de pays qui ont pris l'engagement de pouvoir nous aider à restructurer, à organiser notre armée. C'était le cas de certains pays européens, comme la France, comme l'Allemagne, comme la Belgique, comme l'Italie, des pays qui ne sont pas européens, mais qui sont dans le camp. C'est le cas des États-Unis et du Canada, qui ont été nos principaux partenaires, qui ont permis à l'armée nigérienne d'abord de se reformer, d'être former, d'être équipé et arriver à faire face à la situation. Aujourd'hui, nous avons une situation que nous arrivons à maîtriser. Mais ce qui se passe, c'est qu'un partenariat n'est productif, ne peut donner un résultat que dans la mesure où il y a des armées nationales qui sont suffisamment fortes. Et je crois que c'est ça le défi aujourd'hui auquel beaucoup de pays qui sont confrontés au, euh, au terrorisme font face. Il faut d'abord qu'il puisse y avoir des armées nationales qui soient fortes qui soient formés, qui soient équipés pour arriver à faire face au terrorisme. C'est en ce moment-là que le partenariat est productif. S'il n'y a pas d'armée nationale formée, équipée, ce serait les partenaires qui viendraient éventuellement en appui, qui vont devoir faire le travail à la place de cette armée. Et là, ce qui est sûr, c'est qu'on va directement vers l'échec. La deuxième chose, je pense qu'il faut parler, c'est la question du partenariat, c'est qu'un partenariat est efficace quand il vient à temps. Le temps, dans notre cas, c'est le grand ennemi de la lutte que nous sommes en train de notre, le grand ennemi pour pouvoir donc vaincre par rapport à la lutte que nous sommes en train de mener. Le début du terrorisme dans notre sous-région, c'était quelque chose de, de maîtrisable si nous avons réagi à temps et avec le moyen qu'il fallait. Malheureusement, nous prenons le temps en pensant que cela pourrait arriver. Or, il s'est trouvé que le terrorisme, quand il est venu dans notre sous-région, il a pu profiter d'un terreau, des conditions qui pouvait lui permettre de se développer. C'est quoi ces terreaux C'est d'abord la situation économique dans laquelle nos populations vivaient. Et les jeunes particulièrement étaient dans cette situation-là, où à la limite, ceux qui partaient dans les terroristes, ceux qui soutenaient les terroristes, à la limite, n'avaient rien à perdre, et peut-être qu'ils n'avaient que leur vie à perdre. Or, cette vie, vu les conditions dans lesquelles ils étaient en train de vivre, ne présentait pas une grande chose. Donc, ce qui était particulièrement important pour nous, si dès le départ, nous avons pu faire le nécessaire pour maîtriser la situation dans le temps, avec les moyens qu'il fallait, je suis presque sûr aujourd'hui que la situation aurait été maîtrisée. Malheureusement, nous avons fait fi de ce temps-là et aujourd'hui, le terrorisme tel qu'on est en train de le voir, il est en train de chercher à progresser, à conquérir certains pays. C'était le cas aujourd'hui de certains pays qui sont pratiquement à 40% sous, la, sous le joug du terrorisme parce que le temps n'a pas été utilisé comme il fallait pour qu'on puisse maîtriser la chose. Et deuxièmement, on n'a pas pu gérer le terreau qui aurait pu permettre, qui permettait à ces terrorisme de se développer. Et si nous ne prenons pas garde aujourd'hui, cette situation-là pourrait encore s'étendre. La question de Wagner qui a commencé à s'installer dans certains pays, c'était dû à quoi C'était dû au fait que les gens pensaient qu'avec la présence des partenaires, on pouvait arriver très vite à jubiler l'avancée du terrorisme. Mais comme les gens ne voyaient pas le résultat, l'impatience gagner le terrain, ce sont les coups d'État militaires qui ont commencé à se perpétrer en pensant que c'est parce que c'était des régimes démocratiques qui n'arrivaient pas à faire face à la situation et c'est comme ça que Wagner commençait à s'installer. Mais notre conviction, nous au Niger, nous faisons face à Wagner. Nous faisons face 
à la propagande de Wagner. Nous arrivons à faire face et nous tiendrons par rapport à ça. Et nous y tiendrons à cause du partenariat que nous avons pu développer avec les pays, entre autres, que je vous ai cités tout à l'heure, mais aussi avec le partenariat que aujourd'hui nous cherchons à développer avec l'Union européenne pour y aller dans le même sens. Donc je pense que la chose la plus importante pour nous dans le partenariat, c'est qu'il faut que nous puissions donc agir à temps, que nous puissions arriver à agir sur tous les ingrédients qui peuvent permettre donc au terrorisme de se développer, que nous puissions arriver à agir sur eux pour les éteindre. C'est d'abord, comme j'avais dit, la question de la situation économique, les conditions de vie dans lesquelles nos populations vivent. Il faut que nous arrivions à y faire face à ça. Bien entendu, au niveau local, nous avons d'autres situations aussi auxquelles il faut faire face. C'est un peu le conflit locaux. Parce que le terrorisme, comme on dit, c'est quelque chose qui vient d'ailleurs, qui était venu chez nous d'ailleurs. Il a trouvé un terreau. Il y avait les conditions économiques. Mais il y avait parfois aussi des conflits locaux qui existaient. Et il a pu s'installer grâce à ces conflits locaux. Donc, d'un point de vue local, le gouvernement qui est en place doit faire face à ces deux choses. Arriver à traverser les conditions économiques, arriver à résoudre les conflits locaux qui, qui se présentent pour arriver à éteindre la base qui permet donc aux terroristes de se développer. Je pense que le partenariat doit nous aider à aller dans ce sens-là pour pouvoir donc maîtriser ces questions-là. D'abord, nous avons besoin de la formation au niveau de toutes nos forces, nos forces de défense et de sécurité. Nous avons besoin de l'équipement de ces forces. Nous avons besoin des infrastructures pour ces forces. Et c'est en ce moment-là que nous pouvons donc arriver avec le partenaire à avoir un grand résultat. Je crois que si nous pouvons aujourd'hui arriver à faire quelque chose pour que le terrorisme ne continue pas à progresser en allant vers le golfe de Guinée, il va falloir que très tôt nous pensions que les armées nationales des différents pays qui pourraient être confrontés à cette situation-là vont pouvoir s'équiper, vont pouvoir être formés, vont pouvoir avoir le matériel nécessaire pour qu'ils puissent donc arriver à faire face à la situation. Et le gouvernement, les qui sont en place, doivent prendre en charge certaines questions, notamment qui sont nationales, qui permettent qui permettent aux terroristes de chercher à se développer. Voilà ce que je voulais dire donc sur la question du partenariat. Au Niger, nous en profitons grandement de ce partenariat. Nous sommes aujourd'hui dans une phase avec l'Union européenne. Merci, madame. Nous sommes dans cette phase avec l'Union européenne pour construire un nouveau partenariat qui nous permettra à nos pays vraiment de faire face aux terroristes. Je vous remercie.